Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ben Thomas with UST Training, and I have the pleasure today to introduce to you Mark Barolo, Deputy Director of EPA's Office of Underground Storage Tanks. I was talking with Mark a little bit before the show, and wow, Mark, it was 1997 when I first bumped into you in my first national uh, EPA underground tank conference. I had been up in Alaska. I was, a, uh, for those of you who don't know, I was a tank yank inspector watching tanks come out of the ground in a, in 1985, 86, is that right? 85, 86, 86, 87. And um, Mark, I was just thinking back in the day, my old supervisor, because I was part of the uh, the leaky uh, underground storage tank program, and I w drove all over the state with my little Chevy Chevette, and my gas sniffer, and I, we'd say, dig, dig, dig here. And I'd literally, I'd be lowered into, um, uh, into tank excavation pits, like in a backhoe bucket with a hard hat and a knife. And I'd tell the guy to do it. It crazy days. And uh, we literally had a protocol that says, if you pick up a handful of soil, a, gl a gloved handful of soil and squeeze it and gasoline came out, that was a high priority site. So, I mean, uh, talk about the wild west. I mean, it's been really interesting to watch this program um, evolve mm. from that super crude, um, uh, super basic. We kind of really didn't really know what we were doing, kind of thing, to the modern um, uh, modern standard of UST excellence that we have today. So I've been in the underground storage tank program pre-federal law. Mark, you probably joined us not too uh, long after that. Maybe just a quick like um, when you started, and and maybe just a you know just a quick summary about your your background uh, with EPA. Sure. So I started here in 1993. So a little bit, okay. a little bit after you. So the program was was up and running. The regs were in place, but we still had five years until the the big upgrade or replace deadline of of 1998. So I I came in straight out of college into EPA's Office of Underground Storage Tanks, and I'm going to hit my my 30th anniversary in a couple of months. Kind of wow. Kind of and so and you started off you started off doing what, Mark? So uh, financial responsibility was okay. one of my first first roles and some regional liaison work. And then I got into sort of the leaking underground storage tank trust fund and the eligibility and uses of the leaking underground storage tank trust fund. Eventually got a little bit more onto the prevention side. And then I was the eventually the director of the release prevention division okay. uh, that was responsible for sort of the, the preventing releases side of the program. And then... 12, 13, 14 years ago, I lose track now, uh, became the deputy director of, of the office, sort of you know, working on the, on the full program. Uh, so I've touched on a lot of pieces of the program o over the years. Uh, I've seen, uh, seen a lot of the evolution from, um, from EPA's perspective, uh, but haven't, haven't worked outside of, of EPA. So that's, that's been my, my career path. Uh, what excites me about that, Mark, is that, I mean, I've known a number of directors over the years, and they're oftentimes kind of political appointees kind of come in, you know, from somewhere else, and they're they're smart and bright and good people, but I think you're one of the few people who's literally been in the program for so long, and so I think your um, your institutional knowledge is is so much appreciated, having grown within the, the organization, and you really kind of know all facets of it, versus the Directors, you know, they, they kind of come and go. I, I, I will make a quick pitch, though, for your, the former director, Carolyn Hoskinson, who I think was a tremendous um, cheerleader, if you will, to try to bring everyone to the table. I, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of a program that is collaborative in nature. And I think I just want to give thanks to MoMA for EPA for really wanting to say, well, and, and the number of people attending today, we have service providers, we have operators, we have inspectors, and I think the, the the tune of the national EPA program has been, we've got this great national program where a, a, a collection of states all working together, but really everyone is welcome to the table. Um, you know, you, I, you, the EPA's efforts to include uh, Indian tribes, uh, municipalities, states, uh, federal agencies, uh, private operator service providers, I think it really does make, I one reason you don't hear about the underground tank program in the news so much. I think we kind of quietly run along and we, we, we do our thing. And every once in a while, there's a mishap at a gas station or a delivery or things like that. But I'm I'm just really proud to have been part of this national program over the years. And, and we've seen such great success. I'm hoping today we can kind of learn, um, you know, kind of like the talk says, uh, where we started, kind of where we're at today, and, and maybe where we're going from there. 
So yeah, we'll be I, going. I completely agree. It's probably why I've been here so long, sort of the collaborative <laughs> nature of it. When, you, when you've been around long enough, you see the contribution made by so many different people in so many different ways. And that's, I, I have tried to sustain that. As you said, Carolyn certainly s- sustained that. But I will say that that predates even my time here. That was sort of the, the concept of the program when it was envisioned in, in the 80s, uh, given the size of the universe. It really was not a um, something that was going to be run out of sort of a, you know, a headquarters office or even even EPAs in general. So mm-hmm. from day one, everyone recognized we needed to, to all. We, we, one of the nice things is everyone kind of has the same goal. We have different perspectives and different roles in getting there, but we all really do have the same goal in preventing releases and then getting them cleaned up when when they do happen. So we're not working uh, against each other. We're all just working at it from from different perspectives with different expertise. And so it's made for a really, really constructive relationship over the years, which I've really appreciated. One thing that struck me, Mark, I don't know if I told you this a couple of years ago, we went out and we at the at the tribal lands environmental forum, we went out and did that big field trip out at the Spokane tribe gas station, a terrible smoky air quality day and the bus pulled up and it's a great modern day, pardon me, great modern day, super well organized, super smart operator drip training driven program. And there was something out there, Mark, I couldn't quite remember what it was or something out there that like wasn't quite working, like they were still getting water in the spill bucket. So there was a kind of a problem with the sump. And I remember you being so like, you were like visibly like frustrated, like, like, I mean, you were so like committed to the program, you're saying like, like, why isn't this kind of working better like that? And I was just really struck by how like, it wasn't just like another kind of blah, blah, blah for you. You know, it really showed me that your, your heart was really in wanting this to be a better program. So I, I just wanted to, I, I don't know if, I can't remember what the technical issue was, but I was really struck how how you wanted to make that thing better even after all these years. So yeah, again, n- another another thing. Do you remember what that was offhand? I, I don't, I don't. Yeah, was, I, remember the, I remember the site visit, but I don't remember the technical yeah. issue. Um, do you want to just jump in and, um, sure. and uh, do, let, let me do a little quick screen share here and make sure that's all working okay and i'm going to go like that and if i go full screen mark are you able to uh be able to see that okay i see that i do okay I do. and then and- um so again everyone uh please uh, welcome mark barolo deputy director he's going to talk about the state of the ust nation and, and mark thanks again for taking the time to joining us today Sure. Well, I really appreciate the the invitation. I was kind of excited about it when you when you brought it up. As you indicated, you know we've known each other a long time. I've always appreciated your dedication to the program, which is uh, you've made such a difference over the over the many decades. So proud to proud to have known you all these years, and appreciate the invitation today. Uh, it's really an important program, an ever evolving program. But if we go to the the second slide, Ben, uh, this is sort of just a map of point locations of, of where the sites are around the country. And, and the, what that really means is they're, they're virtually everywhere. They're in virtually every community. Uh, we, we did some GIS mapping and found that 16% of the population of the country lives within a quarter of a mile of an underground storage tank system. Oh, wow. Uh, 90 some percent live within two or three miles, but the quarter mile is a little bit more uh, consistent with sort of the length of a, of a typical plume at, at a release. And 16% of the population lives within a quarter mile. That's really, that's really pretty close. Um, and so, so, so maybe uh, a lot, maybe a lot of the public kind of takes for granted for the fact that there are these sure. giant flammable hazardous <laughs> liquid containers, you know, within a quarter mile of their home. That, that That's an interesting fact. And we use, you know, we all rely on them for, for fueling our vehicles. So there's, there's a lot of, a lot of comfort level there. Um, after almost 30 years in a program, I guess I'm still astonished how much I'm still learning and growing every, every day uh, in reflecting back on the last 30 years, as, as you kind of requested, I, I guess I felt both encouraged and, and humbled. Um, I really kind of marvel at how much has been accomplished during that time and so appreciative of the community that's worked so hard to, to make the program a success. But I guess I'm still humbled by how much more we have to do and how much more we have to achieve and to figure out and to, and to overcome despite working on it for, for decades. So I'll start by reflecting a little bit on, on some of the program uh, experiences and successes. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I see uh, ahead for the program. 
I know we'll, uh, using the chat feature at the end, we'll be able to do some Q's and A's, but if there are questions along the way, I think, I think Ben, you or your, your folks might be monitoring along the way. So Ben, jump in at any time if there's some, some questions that, that come up about, about whatever I'm saying. Yeah, and, and, and thank, thanks for reminding me, Mark. Yes, yeah, so please use the Q&A feature. If you have a burning question you wanna ask it on a particular slide, just uh, type it in on Q&A and I'll be tracking that. And otherwise we'll do an open kind of Q&A at the end as well. Okay, uh, uh, so so far so far so good. Okay. Oh, Scott, Scott Borch gave me a hard time about riding in a in a in a in a spill buck in a in a bucket of a backhoe back in 1986. Forgive me for as that. He As he should. <laughs> um, so some of you may have seen those have been in the program a while. I may have seen it, but it's you can get it on 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 YouTube or Ben. I think you have a connection to it. But there was a 60 minutes episode back in late 1983 called Check the Water that's first sort of exposed the public to the risks associated with leaking underground storage tanks. Within one year of that, Congress had passed the law that started the, the federal underground storage tank program. There are a few states that were, were ahead of EPA. Uh, at the time, there were nearly 2 million underground storage tanks. And one of the first things that the program did was uh, start looking to identify releases that that were out there and there were, we were getting 30, 40, 50,000 releases reported in a given year. I think our biggest year was 70,000 releases that were confirmed in, in one year around the country, which is extraordinary. Not that they were all actively leaking at that time, of course, we were just finding a lot of historic contamination. Uh, one of the other big things looking back is sort of the changes to the to the fuels, obviously leaded fuels back in the day uh, and, and sort of the, the legacy of those to, to clean those up. Some of you were around for the MTB additive days, which uh, obviously uh, became a big challenge from a reme remediation standpoint, much harder to clean up, didn't biodegrade the same way. Uh, then ethanol has been at various levels, has been a big part of the program for 15 or so years and, and will continue to be biodiesel uh, renewable fuels is is something that's that's coming and we're starting to see some and, and no no doubt that will continue to evolve so so i always have to one wonder what is next we've also been thinking a lot recently about natural disasters some of you uh, have probably seen videos or heard stories of tanks popping out of the ground on a regular basis during a flooding event that sort of acts like a beach ball that's held under under the water and wants wants to pop up. It does still happen, and we still see that some from time to time, but it's not nearly as often. And again, due to the improvements in in installation practices and in preparation for for flooding events, so uh, that's been interesting an interesting evolution. I, 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 I get about two or three pictures a year, Mark, of those popping out of the ground. They, they seem to be probably tanks put in without without hold downs. But yeah, so we, we're still we still get a couple of still get a couple of floaters a year that I'm aware of anyways. Right. Now, yeah, we do. We do. But not not quite what we, what we used to. Exactly. So one in, in reflecting back, one thing to look at is the, the change in technology. Um, and you had a great lead into that right riding in the back. Oh, that's that's scary. But <laughs> when I first got here, there were folks in my office working on something called lab in a bag, which was an idea to sort of be able to do some sort of a laboratory analysis on site, working with your hands inside of a bag, kind of like you might develop film back in the day inside of a bag. <laughs> So that didn't really go 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 over very well, but it's it. I, I think of it from time to time because, of course, now we have such sophisticated assessment technology and high resolution site characterization and other things. Um, obviously, substantial improvement in in the cleanup technologies, but in addition to the technologies themselves, the other thing that we've really evolved in is our our understanding of uh, how petroleum works, what happens when it's underground, principles of bioremediation really understanding uh, the LNAPL and that allows us to make smarter decisions. We also have better uh, technology to assess and clean up, but also better understanding of, of the challenge, we can make smarter decisions. So that's been a real advancement over the years. Uh, the internet, of course, Ben, you're, before some came on, you, you mentioned, you know, remembering back, I guess, to the 97 conference when you were encouraging all states to develop websites and while some people thought you were crazy you were clearly a visionary uh so so technology and the internet and what that that's done for for the program on the prevention side of the program we, we used to spend so much time focusing on 
exterior corrosion uh, was one of the biggest focuses of the of the program and really encouraging that where we are now that's nowhere near as, as big a concern as we used to have um, a very relatively small percentage of our releases are are due to exterior corrosion now we're seeing more happening recently with in interior uh, corrosion with some diesel fuels and and now there are we're back looking at some exterior corrosion in some areas because of some of the ethanol fuels but generally speaking sort of corrosion of the the tanks and lines causing releases is is much different than it used to be. Secondary containment, probably the single biggest advancement or improvement in the prevention side of the program from a technology standpoint, uh, along with all the associated containment and monitoring that comes with that. But we have better ways of testing. We have better ways of preparing. We have better ways of installing. Uh, I'm, I haven't done it recently, but, but have in other times in my career sort of compared early versions of some of the some of the standards uh, and recommended practices and see how they they've evolved over time and we're just continuing to learn and improve and there's and there, uh, more recently there's a big movement to third party monitoring uh, a large percentage of the tanks in the country are monitored by by uh, third party companies leaving some of the work to the experts if the owner operators either don't have the expertise or, or the time and that's been that's been a big development in recent recent years so um, you know, continual advancement, the industry continues to innovate, uh, better and more adaptable equipment. And we've seen a lot of adaptation uh, in the last several years, responding to some of the, the uh, corrosion related issues and degradation related issues associated with um, some of the, some of the uh, newer bio, biofuels. Um, so, Every time we, I have an opportunity to go, for example, to the PEI convention and see what the sort of what the latest and greatest in the technology is, it's always very impressive and, and encouraging. So I can't just, can't wait to see what's what's next. Uh, but let's let's talk about a couple numbers very quickly. I won't go into this very much, but if you go to the third slide, um, so there, that, that, this first one's not on the slide, but there are, there are now fewer than 540,000 federally regulated active tanks. It doesn't include heating oil tanks that some states regulate, but less than 540,000 active uh, tanks remain. Again, I mentioned earlier, we started with closer to 2 million. Uh, so there are just under 200,000 um, facilities that we, that we regulate. Over the history of the program, this is on the slide here, there have been over 560,000 confirmed releases. Um, and, but to me, one of the most sort of eye-popping statistics is more than 500,000 of those confirmed releases have been cleaned up. That's the blue line here, and then the, the yellow line at the bottom is, that's the remaining backlog. Those are the sites that still need to be cleaned up, and there's almost 60,000 of those. But if you if you bump to slide four, Ben, you'll see, some of you hopefully saw this. This was a year or so ago we, we released this, just to kind of celebrate this, this major um, multi-decade program accomplishment of cleaning up our 500,000th cleanup completed. And when you really think about it, it's, it's staggering when you think about the amount of work and time and energy is taken. Uh, the regulators, the tank owners, uh, the contractors and consultants, uh, the companies that handle the, the financing side of it, the insurance and the state funds, there are just so many people contributed to that, that collectively, that's really an astonishing amount of work uh, and, re and really impressive and uh, worth, worth taking a moment to, uh, to look at when we're, when we're reflecting. We also, as a program, do almost 100,000 inspections every year, mm. uh, even though the, uh, it's a smaller uh, number of active tanks than we once had, it's still a really massive universe, and it's a massive effort to try to get to inspections uh, as often as possible, generally speaking, no, no less than once every three years. So that's a massive undertaking. Uh, there was a dip, obviously, during COVID, but we're, we're heading back up toward, towards 100,000 after that. Um, and so the last thing on um, sort of the, the looking back reminiscing, if you could jump to the next slide, a year or so ago, um, my office put together a, a timeline. And so if anyone's interested in sort of the history of the underground storage tank program, there's kind of an interesting, uh, I don't know what, what you would call it, a timeline slash slideshow. Uh, and if you go to EPA's website, it's, it's epa.gov backslash UST. And that will get to you to the EPA's underground storage tank website. 
once you're there, look for the, the milestones and underground storage tanks program history, and you can you can kind of scroll through and, and read about it. So anyone who's who's been around a while, it'll be a, a stroll down memory lane. Those of you new to the program, it's probably worth taking a little time to do that, just so you understand sort of where you fit in the in the collective effort of the program, and it will help you um, help you what help you sort of. Uh, be committed, stay committed to the program, realizing um, that, it, that it's been decades of work on a lot of people to get to where we are, and there will be decades uh, in front of us. And that's where I'm going to get to next. So, and, so that's and I, yeah. And I, I, I'll be, I'll offer. <clears throat> I've got a link actually to the uh, 60 Minutes episode. I can send everyone after the webinar, and I'll send them a link to this milestones uh, page okay. as well. Mark, great, great. So that was that was where I was going to stop on kind of the the reminiscing before I start looking ahead of us. Are there any anything that's come up in the in the Q's and A's that we want to talk about now, Ben? Or... Uh, someone asked, do you consider a re-release at a site that has existing wells a new release? That's interesting. So second generation lust site. We do, we do. It's that, considered that a new release. It's not okay. So it, old tanks leaky, clean up new tanks. New leak, new release. New new release. If we basically count a release as when we find it. If we find contamination and it was probably came from two or three tanks, maybe you're doing a closure of an old system and we find a bunch of contamination there, and maybe multiple tanks uh, or overfills or dispensers or lines, you know, contributed to that release. We count that as just one release because we just found it. We deal with it as one. But more temporarily, if years later there's another release at the same facility we would count that as a new and, and second release i know when we do our a b operator training mark we actually start off like in the beginning you know there was that there were leaky tanks and uh it's an interesting point that uh in 1958 or thereabouts a submersible turbine pump comes online and by 1961 red jacket had introduced the mechanical line leak detector right so 27 years before we even had a reg the industry knew that these pressurized lines were were quite problematic. And we can almost call this the leaky underground piping program instead of the tank, just because it still seems that piping seems to be kind of our main challenge as far as the leak source. Yep. Yep. Um, next slide. Okay. So if there are no more Q's and A's at this point, so it's just some, some thoughts from my perspective on, on what might be ahead of us. And I guess I'm sort of categorizing it in two areas. When I look to the future, on one branch, I see much of the same. Uh, and then the second branch, I see really significant change on, on top of that. So what I mean by that, uh, in the much of the same category, there's still a lot of work to do to fully comply with the requirements. Uh, there was a, a Oops, sorry. second generation set of regulations from EPA in 2015, a number of, of states uh, have, have adopted those or something close to those. And the uh, most recent compliance rates we found were 56% technical compliance rate, which, which means of all the facilities inspected in the last year, 56% of them were fully compliant with all of the technical requirements, which means 44 were not. Now, some of those were just missing one or two things. Others were missing a, lo a lot of things. Um, a subset that's made up of, of you know, spill prevention, uh, overfill, corrosion, and leak detection. The leak detection is, is the most challenging of all of those. It's 68% for, for leak detection. So there's really a lot of work still to, to get the word out, uh, to educate, to train, uh, to, to bring those compliance rates up. So that's a big part of what we will continue doing going forward. Uh, Operator training compliance rate is about 87%, and the walkthrough compliance about 78% nationwide. So those are those are a little bit higher, but again, still room for improvement. But as everyone on this call knows, us management is not a one-time effort. You don't invest in it and walk away as if you're done. Really, safely storing petroleum underground takes constant vigilance, which a lot of you are, are actively involved in, in, in part of that effort. Of course, there's a lot of turnover uh, in this industry and there's a constant need for training and retraining and, and more education. Uh, and then of course, on the cleanup side of the program, we still have almost 60,000 confirmed releases 
that we know of with another almost 5,000 reported each of the last few years. So uh, that's that's in the more of the same. We, we're going to continue to have to do the inspections and the training and the and the services and the repairs and uh, and then I, on the on the remediation side of the program. What we've been doing for decades, there's a lot more for us to continue doing down the road. But at the same time, there are going to be some significant changes for the program. So one of those uh, that we're experiencing particularly now is, is labor shortages. Now, this has this actually started before COVID. Now, COVID really amplified it, but it's been a, a, a sort of a longer term challenge for us heading in this direction. Um, yeah, we saw, saw Scott Boris online. PEI has done some real good work here. They have a couple of great training modules for service technicians trying to get people um, sort of into this, into this industry. EPA is exploring whether we can um, sort of piggyback onto the fairly successful Brownfields job training program mm. to try to cover some us testing work. So more, more to come on that, but we're, we're hopeful that that might, might make a dent Go, going forward. But so that's something we're, we're hearing a lot about now, but I do think this is going to be a continuing challenge going forward because again, it's not just coming out of COVID. It was happening before COVID. Um, so of course, evolving, evolving fuels. This is, this has been a challenge and will continue to be a challenge for us. And this is not to say that fuels are better or worse. They're just different. And anytime you have a, a different chemical composition, it's going to affect underground storage tanks differently. There's continued uh, effort and pressure for more ethanol in the fuels uh, and, and biodiesel, uh, but then there's also talk about renewable biodiesel, uh, biodiesel or renewable diesel, which is different than biodiesel. So it's it's a I, ant I anticipate continued movement in that direction and evolution of the fuels, the liquid fuels that we use, and along those lines. Now, if you could jump to this next slide, Ben. I want to make sure people are aware of either for themselves if they own and operate or if you're if you work with owners and operators as a service provider or a regulator. Uh, there's a lot of money being made available to upgrade and replace tank systems to make them compatible with higher mm -hmm. ethanol blends. So the US Department of Agriculture has the uh, higher blends infrastructure incentive program which you can just Google that and you'll, you'll find it. This is, a, this is just a screenshot from their, their website. There's a lot of money available. They've had now $300 million grant programs and they got a law last year passed for them another $500 million program that is, that is still to come. So if your tanks, we're gonna talk about aging tanks in a little bit. If your tanks are getting to the point where you need to upgrade or replace them, this is a great time to do it and you can get some significant financial assistance to do it. When you do that, you're going to put in a, a system that's fully compatible uh, with higher ethanol blends. It in includes dispensers as well. Now, anybody who's putting in a new system nowadays, you really should be putting in a fully compatible system. Mm -hmm. We just don't know where the fuels are going. The incremental cost at time of installation is so much less than the cost to go back and retrofit later. So, you, you really should be doing that anyway, and there's some funding to help you do that. So I wanted to make sure you were, you were aware of that. So evolving fuels certainly is gonna to continue to be a challenge for the program. All the while, this is the next issue, uh, we're seeing a massive push to electrify our transportation. And there's a good chance that this is gonna be our future or a, or a large portion of our future, which will eventually have a major impact on the tanks program. And I'll get, get into that more, more in a minute. But sort of hearkening back to the, the much the same part of what I was saying, it's going to be a long transition. There are some parts of the country where it will move faster than others. There are parts of the country that will resist it. Uh, I know there already there are several states that have created targets or even mandates for electric vehicle sales uh, in, in the out years. But the flip side of that, we've already seen Wyoming They've banned the sale of electric vehicles after 2035. And there are several other states, uh, I know of Oklahoma, Mississippi, there may be others that are considering some sort of a, a, a ban on, on EV sales. So there's the push and the pull and, and where, where exactly it's going to go and how fast is, is anyone's guess. I have a quick story from a colleague from Colorado. 
And they got to a facility, an, an US facility. And at that US facility, there were three or four new charging stations, uh, which, which we're starting to see, of course. But this one had a big metal shipping container behind it. And, and they, they asked about it. And it turned out that in that community, there was not sufficient electrical supply to, pro to, to provide the electricity for those three to four um, charging stations. And so they put a giant generator, diesel fuel <laughs> generator in this container behind the, uh, the charging stations to generate on-site electricity, which of course defeats the whole purpose of, of going this direction. But I, I say that only to, to, I guess, give an example of how the path is gonna be uh, bumpy and probably long uh, and the need for underground storage tanks equipment uh, for the manufacturing, uh, for the repair, the inspection, the, you know, the operation, the innovation, that's going to really continue for decades. I know certainly in where I live, I see, I'm seeing a huge buildup of convenience stores in, in recent years. So the service station industry certainly doesn't see uh, a cliff in terms of sort of, a, you know, a, a huge drop off in the need for liquid fuels any, anytime soon. Other things related to the transition to e, uh, EVs though, one factor that I know a lot of states are considering is funding. There are a lot of states whose programs, especially if they have cleanup funds, uh, are funded by taxes or fees on liquid fuels. And so the more miles driven by electric vehicles, the less mm -hmm. revenue there is for, for these programs. Of course, it's a bigger issue in the, in the highway funds uh, world, uh, but it is an impact on the, on the tanks program. So collectively states are, are exploring solutions there. Uh, but the fuel tax is a, is a, is really how they they fund the highway highway fund and all the construction and repair of the, of the highways. So similar issue at a, at a smaller scale for the tanks program. But also eventually, as the need for liquid fuels decline, there will be more underground storage tank sites that that close. When sites close, that's often a time where we see more releases. Uh, Sometimes when a site closes, the, the tank owner does what they're supposed to do and they properly close the tank and they do the assessment and the cleanup if, if needed and they leave a, a clean property. But as we those who were around during the 1998 deadline days know, there will be plenty of facilities where someone will just leave the keys on the, on the counter and leave and, and never be seen again. So we do anticipate there will be some abandoned systems, which then it becomes a, a public funding need. Uh, so those are all impacts that are going to happen for the tanks program. It is all a little ways off. It's not this year. It's not next year. It's not a couple years from now, but it, it is in the, in the future for our program. So something we need to be aware of. Um, I'll try to go quickly through these last couple items. Oh no, so, you're, 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 you're doing great on time, Mark. In fact, I, there's okay. been a request for a copy of a picture of the generator at the EV station in Colorado. <laughs> I, I, I can ask for it. I don't have one, but I, I I want to say I saw it on social media somewhere. Someone who was not really impressed with electric vehicles, I think, kind of was making kind of terrible fun of that that particular. Uh, we'll call it a, a transitional species. <laughs> right, and it's really, and I I mentioned it really only to indicate that the the road mm -hmm. in that direction is going to have twists and turns along the way. Well, and I, I'm thinking of a similar metaphor. I mean, all, all, there's all sorts of changes afoot in our lives, right? Someone sent me a picture recently of an automatic tank gauge that had a remote monitoring box attached to it, but it also still had instructions for how to get information out of the tank monitor, right? So it was like this kind of transitional species. It, it should have been completely ignored because someone back at a you know, remote office is monitoring the thing, but it also, the instructions kind of said like, ignore the box and, and do this anyway. So it was just kind of this push-pull transitional time. And I suspect we'll see a bunch of these generator slash EV transitional species until things settle out a bit more. Sure, absolutely. Uh, no other question, but, but again, feel free to ask questions if you have, um, uh, someone's kind of making fun about the California market for uh, electric vehicles is probably gonna include a lot of generators before it's all over. But uh, no yeah, questions so very, far. It's, I, it's, it's an area I need to learn more about, but I understand the, the electrical availability in communities can vary very widely. So I think in some areas it won't be a problem in others it'll be it'll be more difficult but mm -hmm. so let me let me touch on one other um this is more of sort of evolution of technology but sort of the geographic information system and and, and some of the tools that are available yeah thanks um so many states actually have all their us location information publicly available and you can 
lust, or both the uh, active lust, uh, active us, and and the the cleaning cleanup sites. EPA pulled together a bunch of the state data systems, uh, as well as our own data on tanks in Indian Country, and we developed a tool called Ust Finder, which is actually a very cool tool. It's in its first generation, and I think future generations will be even better. And and what I primarily mean by that is that this is right now it's static based on the data systems that we've received a couple of years ago, uh, but we're working on a way to make it a little bit more real time. So it'll, it'll continue to be um, e even more useful. But there are so many things that, that can be done when you have locational information. I've, I know of, of some states that are, have found more efficient inspection routes using GIS systems uh, when, they, when they have them located. So it just you know, saves them time and makes them more efficient. Uh, if you look at the US Finder or some of the other tools out there, you can have all kinds of overlays with, with other locational information like hurricane impact zones or uh, areas where there's gonna be imminent flooding uh, in, within the next 10 days, public drinking water systems, wildfire areas, the list, go, the list goes on and on. So information age really is here. We need to take advantage of it. There's a lot we, we can do with it. The tools continue to get better and better. And I'm really excited about this US Finder system and in particular sort of the the future generations of it that are going to build on the, the good work that's been done to date. So I wanted to take a minute just to just to highlight that. And uh, Mark, there is a question. Does us finder include closed tanks or just active tanks? Both. Both. And, and, and I guess and also temporarily out of service tanks, obviously. Right. right. I wanted to put and in I a, think I'm sorry. The next couple. So one of one of the things that uh, the developers of it of it did. It's, it's actually some some folks in, in EPA's Office of Research and Development who put it together. Uh, some of you may have may have seen some some webinars on it, but uh, they tried to get sort of the common data across all the all the states. Uh, and so there's less information in us finder about an individual facility than there would be within a state's database, but not all the state's databases are are publicly available. Um, and we had to sort of do sort of the lowest common denominator, but I think the 2.0 version and future future versions of this are going to include more and more data about each each facility. So I'm I'm very excited about that. In in my world of operator training, Mark, I don't know if you know this, but we've actually linked for every AB operator training course that we have for purchase on our webpage. If a state has an online database, we not only link to that, but we encourage people to get onto the site, download their report. So that they actually have a, you know, do I have double wall, single wall, fiberglass, submersible, whatever, whatever. And so with right. that in mind, if they print off a facility report that says exactly what they have, then when they take the training, which unfortunately is not customized to them, it's, you know, everything in the kitchen sink kind of thing, then we can help operators say, okay, I'm going to like really pay attention to this section because I've got a tank gauge or I've got, you know, cathodically protected steel. And so as more states come online on board with online databases, we'll be linking to them. Because in the beginning, we just we used to just ask a bunch of, do you have do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? Because if you know what you have in the ground up front, then the training is going to be a lot more meaningful. And unfortunately, you have to be exposed to all the rules and regulations to get there. I know that, uh, I mean, in my world, probably your world too, you know, when someone asks a technical question about underground storage tanks, the answer is always prefaced by saying, well, it depends. It depends on if this and that and so on and so on. So the maddening part about doing operator training is to try to cut through that noise. And so I really applaud the... 12 or so states that we have linked our training course to to try to shorten that so people can kind of zero in on the stuff that matters and the other stuff is just kind of informational let, let it let, let it roll off your back kind of thing so i i'm hoping we'll see more and more of these states do you have a collection of states that have online databases i'd love to take a peek at that it, it, just to calibrate with my list as well i can i personally don't know i could check with the folks who do who do all okay. this work it's, that'd be super yeah. I, yeah I, I mean at some point it's hopefully all going to be readily available so that operators can have a good sense of what they've got in the ground okay uh state of ohio does a great job for tank information with a user-friendly database i think it's called otter i think we're connected to that does EPA require all states to offer tank information to be updated and current? I think the answer is yes for reporting purposes, not necessarily for public access purposes, I, right? I think that's that's correct. If if the question is about about public access, we do not require 
We do not require electronic public access. It always has to be accessible, but that, you know, back in the day that started with reading rooms. You know, you could go to a facility yeah. and you go to the reading room and get, get files on any. So it's all, you know, it's public, but it's not always sort of easily accessible. And I think different states are at different stages of getting all of their data in a, in a system that can be uh, easily viewed and, and sort of manipulated and analyzed. I, I mean, EPA's, <coughs> pardon me, EPA has been collecting uh, compliance or tank inventory data from the very beginning, right? We, we collect a relatively small amount of data from the states every year, oh. but it does include how many active tanks. Okay. Yeah, but it's not, uh, we don't collect on a regular basis any more details than that. This, the program was designed from beginning to be really um, state implemented except in Indian country where, uh, where there's not state jurisdictions so EPAs, um, you know, in partnership with our, with our tribal partners mm -hmm. directly implements the program in Indian country, but outside of Indian country, all the detailed information sort of on a notification form, for example, that's all maintained in the, in the state database. Great. So tied into the, the tools and the JS tools that are available. I did want to touch on another, another topic, which is uh, in sort of the looking ahead category is, focusing on sort of disproportionately impacted communities. So there are a lot of communities that, that really are uh, sort of disproportionately impacted by environmental and, and other burdens. And that's, people have known that for a long time, but some of the tools that are available make it easier to, to identify some of those, those communities. And so there's, there's really an emerging understanding of this issue, a lot of work uh, to determine how to factor those, those concerns into the, the decisions we make in all of our environmental programs, tank, tanks programming included. Um, so, you know, for example, how do we account for cumulative risk to a community? Um, we, on the cleanup side of the program, we look at, at the US release, what kind of risk that US release is imposing on the community and make decisions based on that traditionally. But the challenge for us is how do we, take a broader look and see what are the other risks to that community and does that change in any way the decisions we make about uh, the, the tanks release. So it's not easy, but it's important and it's something I know that, that our agency is, is, is focused on for all environmental programs, but certainly including, including the tanks program. That, that was kind of the, the theme of uh, the National Tanks Conference in September in Pittsburgh, if I recall. Yep, right. Super right. cool. The last one I was going to touch on, uh, I think there's a slide on this, uh, Ben, is aging tanks. Uh, I think this data comes out of out of us finder, but the average tank is approximately 27 years old. So average, again, those average, average average nationwide, nationwide 27 That's years amazing. old wow. varies a little bit by state because some states have had mandatory upgrades for secondary containment, or uh, some states require systems to come out of the ground if they've reached a certain stage, uh, but average. 27 around the country. And again, those who've been around a while may remember the 1998 deadline. And so brand spanking new tank that went in in 1998, that's now 25 years old. And any tank that was upgraded in 1998 had to be installed before the, you know, 10 years earlier, 88 or, or before. So those are at least 35 years old if it was an upgraded tank. Uh, so just the population really is is getting older, and that and that brings lots of lots of challenges for us. So, is there a higher risk of release from these? Uh, I know the insurance companies are trying to figure out what what they want to do in terms of continuing to provide or not coverage, and what's the right price point for that. So, I think there are tank owners being Im being impacted by that. These are systems are going to at some point need to be closed and or replaced. And we still find the majority of our releases when there's work being done, when you're, when you're digging at a site. So if we're going to up, uh, close or replace, we're going to have a big influx of new releases, which means the cleanup side of our program is going to have to deal with all of those. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned earlier, a certain percentage of those are going to end up being abandoned. And when it's abandoned, it, it just leaves the leaves the problem to to the public to deal with and funding for 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 public programs is, is always always a challenge so and, aging and tanks is 
Oh, uh, so th there are a couple of states that are are requiring the sunset of tanks over a certain age. Connecticut comes to mind. Do, are, in North Carolina, maybe. I think there. I'm gonna I'm gonna say about eight. The, I think the um, actually all the New England states and DC okay. and Florida and I think California and maybe one or two others maybe. At they're doing it differently. Some say when it hits the any tank that hits 30 years has to come out or if it hits a yeah. warranty period, it has to come out or only if it's single wall um, mm. or, you know, there, and there are various, various iterations of it. And some are 35 years, some are 30 years. So everyone's do, those states that are doing it are all doing it a little bit differently. But the concept is in, in some parts of the country, there is sort of a, a mandate to get, I guess, at least for some of the US systems to, to turn those turn those over. Uh, but that's not true in in most of the most of the states, and it's not it's not true in the in the federal regulations. So aging tanks has been on the mind of of a lot of folks who who are in the program. This is something that that is an issue for us in in the coming years, um, as we're we're both sort of turning over into a new a new generation of underground storage tanks, while also thinking about. Uh, maybe exiting underground storage tanks with the electric vehicles and all of those sort of uh, converging together. And so all of that is before us. And so again, lots of the, of the uh, continuing work of making sure whatever systems are there are being operated properly. Uh, if any have releases dealing with the cleanup of them, but then also factoring in all the, all these other, um, all these other issues that are that are hitting us now or will be hitting us in the in the near future. So that's a little bit on what I what what we're thinking about in terms of uh, the future issues for the program to consider. So uh, it's a little bit of the my my crystal ball. And okay. if there's whatever time remaining remaining, if there are any other Q's and A's, I'd be happy to happy to engage. If you haven't already done so, go to EPA's webpage, epa.gov forward slash UST. There's a treasure trove of information. Every twice a year, EPA publishes kind of a report card of the nation's UST success. I, I often try to do a, do a news blog about that. So at twice a year, Mark, I kind of put those numbers out there for people like we're like right. today or kind of interested in the big picture of things. It's super helpful there. And then, you know, Mark's a uh, uh, email and contact information. I've found EPA officials to always be very generous with passing out contact information. I don't have to go through 10 different mm -hmm. gatekeepers to be able to talk to Mark and, and his team. And so I, yeah, I want, want to say thank you for that. Um, I'm going to just turn off the share screen for a second. Um, so the stuff I hear on the streets, Mark, that still needs some uh, extra work. It's uh, record keeping seems to be a challenge. Um, monthly walkthrough inspections. I, I, I mean, people are doing them. They may not, may or may not know exactly what they're looking at. Um, keeping keeping water out of sump, stuff like that. Th those are some of the uh, <clears throat> ethanol compatibility. Th those are some yep. of the kind of big ticket issues I see. Are, are there? I always like to ask a state regulator. So I guess I'll kind of throw it out to you. Are, are there are there things out there that you kind of thought? but it still could need a little bit more attention on there. Are there, I mean, cause we have inspectors and operators and service techs on the line here, you know, what, 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 what should we continue to be putting our attention to operationally with, you know, functioning UST systems? Where, where should we be putting our, 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 our juice right now? Yeah. So the original regulations did a pretty good job of requiring new equipment to, you know, reduce the likelihood of a release where, where they were not quite as strong was in making sure it continued to, to operate properly. So this sort of the second generation regulations was really focused on checking and testing to make sure that what you have there is continuing to, to function properly. So I really think that's where we are now. We're, we're long past the stage of making sure people have, have the right equipment in place. But if you put in a spill bucket to meet the 1998 deadline, that's not going to be a, a fully functioning spill bucket any longer. It's just not, they don't have that kind of a lifespan. They get a lot, there's a lot of wear and tear, vehicles drive over them and freeze and thaw. Uh, they don't, they just don't last that long. So sort of continued vigilance on checking and testing to make sure the equipment continues to, to function properly. I know there's uh, constant uh, communication and education needed to help ensure people are remain aware of that and are, are working on that. I am also hearing around the country some some challenges with 
uh, just labor shortages. And there are a lot of mm -hmm. folks who are calling their service technicians to, to get the work done that needs to get done. And, and they're not able to have someone come out there as quickly as they want or need. And so I know some of the inspectors are seeing lack of compliance, um, even if the tank owner was attempting to comply, but they just weren't able to get somebody out there there in time. Uh, and of course, there's always people that are gonna, they're gonna do their best to avoid it. And that, that sort of enforcement is a piece of the program that it's an important part of the program. Uh, but I think, you know, ensuring compliance is always, is always the, the primary goal. And so staying vigilant on ensuring people are aware of what they need to do and to get the checking and testing done. Um, if there are limitations on uh, service providers or replacement parts or that kind of thing, I know different states have different approaches on, on how, they're, how they're accommodating that and I know, I know people are accommodating that. Um, I've, I, I, I've, heard, I, I, I've heard there's a shortage of not only service technicians, but petroleum delivery drivers as well as convenience store clerks and cashiers. So I think there's a, there, there is a job market stress on the whole system. I, that's exactly right. And it's much more than just this, this industry, of course, right. you, know, you go to a restaurant and you see the sign on the door, that says, please, <laughs> please be patient. Please forgive our slow service for short staff, which, which we didn't used to see. So it's, it's an interesting time from that perspective. I'm, I'm hearing some from some folks that the uh, supply chain challenges that have been a struggle um, are they're seeing signs of improvement. So the hope is that that will rectify itself. Uh, but the um, sort of the, the service side of it with just having enough trained staff is continues to be a, a challenge and probably will continue to be a challenge. I had a question. Uh, you mentioned a push for third party monitoring. Is the push regulatory? Are any states currently requiring this? It's not a regulatory push. The regulatory regulations basically say, this is what you, the tank owner or operator have to do. How you do that is completely up to you. Uh, some do it on their own. Some have sort of, you know, bigger companies might have their own sort of environmental department that will take care of it. But in recent years, especially with the advancement of technology to make it easier to do remote monitoring, there's really been an explosion in people relying on uh, uh, third party companies. And so it's, it's more of a, it's one way of getting it done. And each business makes their own decision on whether that's the best way for them. It's not a requirement uh, by, by EPA or, or by any state that I'm aware of. I think it's been a pretty creative response of the free market. I mean, sure. I, think of, I think of California and Colorado in particular, tons of third party designated operators. There's a whole industry about people who go out and do the monthly walks through inspection because those people inherently are better equipped to know what they're looking at. So yeah, it's been really interesting to watch the uh, the market respond. I actually did a, I've done a webinar. I'll probably do it again. Um, leveraging internet technology for better UST compliance. And the more I started digging, there is a service specialist company for virtually any aspect of UST management, whether it's stick in the tanks or remote fills or deliveries or tank fluid levels. I mean, the, the, the market, it seems to be continued to expand. We have a couple of these uh, vendors on, on, on the call here today. So I think it's been pretty cool. My, my old friend, uh, Steve Rapora is no longer with us. Always like to say, hire your weaknesses. <laughs> you're not good at something, right, then right. you know, get right. someone who is. And, and I think this is a, a very creative uh, uh, example of that. The other thing exciting about it is there's a treasure trove of data that's, that's, being, that's being generated. And I think there's the opportunity. I've already had some good conversations with folks in that, in that side of the industry where you know, stripping out names and keeping everything you know, private, there's a lot that we collectively as the, the tanks, you know, community can learn mm -hmm. when there's that much data being, uh, being collected and can be, can be mined, you know, data mined appropriately. So that's something else that I think is, is before us. I think we are going to learn things that we didn't know uh, because there's so much more data being, being generated and every alarm that's being recorded and tagged and it's in a data system somewhere, it's going to, it's going to be very helpful for the program. Which is a great lead in the next question. <clears throat> Pardon me. Where is a data review of age tanks with correlation to more prone to leaks? In other words, is there, is there a data report somewhere that shows the correlation of age, age to leaks? Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we are hoping to do as we get these next generations of this us finder data data system okay. and we get sort of some of that next level data I, I there isn't one that i'm aware of that 
uh, where we have that. We've, mm, I, I mean, mean I've, you've, you've often relied on uh, tank expiration warranties as kind of a trigger action date. Is that, is that fair to say? Um, there are some who use that as a trigger action date. I don't know that we necessarily have seen that. I've, I've heard over the years that uh, in sort of the, the first several years of an installation is often when you will see some um, some releases if there's an oh. installation related issue oh, uh, I didn't know that. makes it past that okay. first period of time then there's a good chance that it will last for for a significant amount of time we i've not seen any data that sort of says by year x there's a there's a real issue and the other part of that is of course the the tank age that we have is really that just that it's just the tank itself and of course the tank itself is a relatively small percentage of the total releases but the tank age doesn't always correspond to the piping age Correct. or the spill bucket age or the fill pipe, you know, so there's a lot of things that get switched out in a facility over the course of the tank life. And so we really have installation dates for tanks, but we don't have it for all the other equipment. So that's another area where the correlation gets complicated because it's not mm -hmm. so much the tank itself that's having the release. And if that system hasn't been addressed in 20, 30 years, that's a, that's a bigger, bigger concern, but you could have a 30 year old tank with six year old piping and a two year old spill bucket and, you know, other, other components. So. My, my very first tank savvy minute video, which is now 11 or 12 years old, there's new spill buckets there. I need to go back and stand on top of the very tank. I was at 12 years ago and saying, see this brand new fresh concrete around the spill bucket. Here's a progression of tanks. And yeah, I, I wonder, I wonder why they had to replace it. Was it, worn out or leaking or yeah interesting right. um um uh someone also also asked do you foresee any additional testing requirements in the future for these aging tanks a anything more than what we're currently doing leak detection etc i mean i can say right now that the epa is not not pursuing um sort of next generation underground storage tank regulations um, the regulations we came out with in 2015 that was the end of sort of an eight year um, period of time. So it's not a, it's not a fast process to do federal regulations. I, so I right, often, right. I often tell operators we're literally running out of things to test. <laughs> Is that fair to say? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the whole vision of this, of the last round was to check to make sure whatever we have is, is continuing to function properly. And I don't know that I've, I've heard, um, anyone sort of say, well, we missed, we missed really important pieces in that, in that regulation. But it's an interesting question about for an aging system. Uh, I, I know there may, may be some insurers on the line. It's possible that some insurance companies for sort of um, loss prevention reasons might, might be asking for something new or different as, as tanks reach, reach a certain, certain age, but okay. not, uh, we don't have that as a regulation. Uh, if you don't mind, Mark, a couple more questions. We're, we're, we're at the top of the hour, but we, uh, the questions are continuing to come in. Uh, how active is EPA with above ground storage tanks? I know you've got the SPCC plan universe for certain above ground storage tanks. Uh, <laughs> states like New Mexico now regulate ASTs just like they do USTs. Any, any, any interest in that direction? Any, any more than the SPCC rules that are already out there? So that is exclusively driven by the federal law. And until and unless the law changes, um, sort of the underground storage tank program, we have no authority to 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 work on on that side of it. There's a whole, you know, active program that deals with above ground storage tanks and SPCC, like you're talking about. Um, it's it, it was designed under different laws with sort of different purposes. It's much more focused on preventing releases to to navigable water. Right. Uh, rather than dealing with sort of subsurface contamination. So they're set up very differently with, with different laws. So I, I get that question a lot as well, why don't you guys try to do what some of the states are doing and get, make the programs together? It's the same substance and, and understand all that, but it's not, a, it's not within the discretion of EPA to do that. Okay. Um, someone asks, is a 30, 35 year UST sunset being considered by EPA or is that being left up to the states? I, I think that's really, it'll be a state by state thing, huh? Well, right. As of right, I mean, we, you know, we, we wondered about that when we were drafting our last set of regulations, um, but the, the final decision by the agency was that we were not at that point going to require any kind of removal retrofit requirements, rather um, just checking and testing existing um, 
assist, you know, equipment. And if that, if that equipment doesn't pass those tests, then it has to be, has to be replaced. Um, so right now EPA is not working on any regulations okay. that would, would have any kind of a, a set date by which a system has to come out of the ground. Okay. Um, uh, someone said new double wall tanks have a one year backlog. So we're about, about a year out from getting new double wall tanks. Someone said, I'm finding facilities that blame the contractors for requiring for required testing to be compliant. They say it worked this long and when did the changes come and why now? I mean, at the end of the day, it's the owner operator who's responsible for compliance, right? And I, I often encourage operators to really rely heavily on their contractors to help them navigate the rules on testing and all this and that. But at the end of the day, it still is the UST owner operator's responsibility. And, and it, I mean, ultimately it is, it is, but I will say it, it can be a challenge because that, you know, there's so many other things that, that a underground storage tank owner operator are, are dealing with and have to be experts on. One of the challenges we really run into there is when there are bordering jurisdictions, uh, because it, it's a lot, you know, it made a lot of sense to have the program operated primarily by the by the states, and then in Indian country, it's it's EPA. Um, but that leads to slightly different programs, slightly different requirements, slightly different deadlines. And so I know we've heard a lot in recent years challenges where a tank owner feels like they got the wrong information. Uh, and that may be because someone primarily works in one jurisdiction and then they've, they've, they've crossed over to do some business, but don't know the, um, the rules in that jurisdiction as well. We certainly see that in Indian country, which is a relatively small percentage of, of the tanks. But if there's a contractor who are, or a service provider who works in a, in a primarily in a state and they know those state regulations really well, and they do some work in Indian country, the state regulations aren't what are applicable. It's the federal regulations. And so we, I know we've had some good conversations with, uh, with PEI and had some some articles and newsletters and and opportunities to raise that at um, at various sessions and just helping to get that word out because that's that's important because we do tend to rely on on people that are more experts than us and I, mm -hmm. so I do hear that story a lot and I understand the uh, inclination to rely on what what you're hearing from the the service providers but the service providers I do need to know the different requirements in the different jurisdictions. I'm on a couple social private social media groups of UST service providers and I got to jump in every once in a while I got into a I think I actually reached out to some of your people about the placement of the leak detector downstream of the turbine and people are like no nah, no nah, nah, the way it's always been kind of thing like that so every once in a while I've got to step in and kind of help do a little bit of course correction there too. Um, we uh, comment uh, license installers are at a crisis point and in New Mexico, for example, you have to work in the field for two years before you can take the ICC exam and then get licensed. We can't keep people for two years. So there's there's maybe some states have some rules where we want to make sure we've got qualified people, but the barriers to entry maybe are, are more significant than the benefits of, of not having the bar so high. That's it, it is one thing that the federal program never created, which is a yep. national license certification program. It has been left up to the states, unfortunately. I don't know if you have any thoughts or remedies. For, well, both for, for good and for bad. You know, uh, there are times I feel like we would have we did a disservice by not doing that. Other times I feel like that's just better managed at the at the local level. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think that fits right into the the challenges we're, we're running across the board in in um, sort of the labor supply and getting enough people in the mm -hmm. industry and that's a that's a good example of we hear a, in a lot of a lot of the underground storage tanks regulators so whether they be inspectors or on the, on the cleanup side we often hear come into the program they learn they learn it and then they move on and so there's a constant churning of, of teaching teaching new folks but that it's an interesting twist on it with that question you you can't do it unless you have two years of experience but if you can't keep people two years years then hard to, hard to have anybody with that with that kind of experience that's interesting that's i would that's hope that if you're in a state you could work with your state petroleum <laughs> market or trade association and bring and bring everyone to the table and see if there's rule if there's room for a you know fair regulatory change i mean there's there are mechanisms in place to be able to uh, modify state regulations to accommodate you know the the, the times they're in covid uh, uh labor shortages uh, just parts distribution uh, uh disruptions things like that that's kind of all I got for questions. I think um, this, I'm gonna to try to make this available on YouTube. We'll get, we'll get a, get, get, make sure EPA signs off on this. But uh, Mark, it's just been a pleasure to have you with us here and to be able to 
take the time again after all these years you know still excited and interested and in, and in wanting to see that the ust program uh advance in, in a way that we can all you know be the best operators inspectors, service technicians we can I, I really appreciate your time well thanks ben it's been a privilege to to be in this program and work for such great people like your like yourselves and many of the other folks on the on the call today so thank you all for for what you do wish you all the best and uh yeah any questions uh, other other ideas or, or questions or suggestions have the contact information. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.